Well, if you have a Bible, let's open up to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. We're in the New Testament. If you have no idea where that is, feel free to use the table of contents. It's not a sin to use it. And we're going to be looking at a few verses here in Galatians chapter 4. And what we've been doing and what we typically do this time of year is we take a particular hymn or Advent song and then take a particular phrase out of it and just kind of hang our Advent series on that. You've noticed from maybe the cover of your bulletin and the opening song, we're using this hymn, Comfort, Comfort, Ye My People. That's kind of the framework that we're looking at. And so this week, we're going to hone in on a phrase in the second stanza, Yea, her sins our God will pardon. And so we're going to look at that this morning. And so while you're opening up to Galatians chapter 4, we're going to look at verses 4 through 7 this morning. Have, Have you ever had to sit and listen to a list of all your failures being read out loud? Maybe a performance review, maybe in the midst of a relational conflict, maybe, you know, like in the midst of a breakup, you know, where all the ways that you have fallen short or missed the mark are being read out loud, and you're just having to kind of endure it and listen to it. And the worst part of it is, is you probably know that it's all true. And I've told this story before, one of the most humiliating experiences of my life happened when I was in band in ninth grade. If you have ever been in the band and you've ever had to go to a, like one of these performances where you have to go at the end of the year, and I played alto saxophone at the time, and I'd been nominated to attend an end-of-the-year concert band competition in South Carolina, and included two main components. One was like a pre-prepared piece that you would work on and you would go in and perform it for this panel of judges. And then what they would do is they would hand you a sheet of music you'd never seen before and you had to sight read it on the fly. And what they did is you can imagine entering into a room by yourself with three adult band directors who all had training and they were sitting at a table and you had, you had to hand them a copy of your prepared piece and then they each picked up a red pen and you heard the click. Then what you did was you would finish the, play, the piece that you had practiced, and then they would hand you this sheet of music you'd never seen before, and you're expected to play it note for note while the judges follow along, red pen in hand. Then, after you are done, they proceed to point out in great detail, because that's their job, that's what they're doing, great detail every single thing that you messed up. As you can imagine, my critique took quite a while, There was a lot of red on the sheet there, and it has always stuck with me. I remember like it happened yesterday. I remember that feeling walking into that room, and you see these band director judges, and you're like, oh, no, I am in big trouble, and here I am, a freshman in high school. I remember like it happened yesterday. It's never easy to hear a detailed list of your failures and all the ways that you have fallen short. When I was an intern at Uptown and even when I was back there as an assistant pastor, one of the things that we all kind of braced for was the kind of post-sermon critique that you would get, oftentimes at the back of the room. At the end of the service, people would come and be happy to point out all the ways that you have fallen short, and all of us interns would brace for that and the following lunch that would come. And you may have a similar time in your life that you've happened, or if you haven't had that happen, you pray that that day never comes. Now imagine you are living back in the Old Testament times in the ancient Near East. Every year you would attend multiple temple services. You would try your best to keep the myriad of Old Testament laws and then offer sacrifices on the Day of Atonement and all these other various ceremonies and washings and things that you had to do. Asking God for mercy for all the ways that you fall short year after year always falling short, year after year, always needing to go and do these things over and over again. The modern day equivalent would be feeling trapped on an endless religious treadmill. It feels like you're working really hard, but you don't ever feel like you're ever getting anywhere. You're doing all the stuff, but you never really feel like you make any forward momentum there. Each day, the law reveals more sin in your heart, which leads to an endless sacrifice to atone for your sin, It's exhausting, it's disheartening, it's discouraging. There's a song that I like to listen to. It's part of the Andrew Peterson, Behold the Lamb of God uh, series that's been out for many years now. It's the song Deliver Us. And one of the the stanzas from that says, it's speaking about the people in the Old Testament. It's written from their perspective. It says, our sins, they are more numerous than all the lambs we've slain. Our shackles, they were made with our own hands. Like a house of mirrors, God's holy law is placed before you. 
And all you can see day after day is just your faults and failures from every single angle. And it seems like you just can't find a way out. God's unflinching holy standard is placed before you. You've got red marks all over your page. The call to obey perfectly, which is do this perfectly every time and live. It never ends. You feel like this cycle of, I always fall short and I always have to keep atoning and I always have to keep going and doing all of this stuff. When is that ever going to end? Day after day, more weight is stacked upon your shoulders as you again fall short. More red marks on the page, more trips to the temple, more, more ways to try to atone for yourself. It just feels like you're in this constant cycle. When is it ever going to end? Deliver us, O Lord. You feel that weight. And just at the moment when you feel like all hope is lost, God shows up in an incredible way. Let's read about that. Galatians chapter 4, starting in verse 4. Just a few verses for us this morning, but super important. Keep what has happened in the Old Testament in your mind. Remember, Galatians comes in a timeline of God's history of redemption. And you have this Old Testament crying out, Lord, when is the deliverer going to come? And remember, this Christmas and Advent season that we're in is a time of waiting. And look at how God shows up in an amazing way. Verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. The grass withers. And the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. I'm grateful for that, and I hope you are. Let's pray and ask the Lord's help. Pray with me. Father, as we come to your word, we are grateful that you've not left us alone to figure all of this out. You have given us your word and love so that we can know who you are and how we are to live in your world. You've given us the Holy Spirit to lead and guide and direct us, Lord, into truth. And Father, you've given us the church and each other. And so, Father, as we come before you, we ask and pray that you would take these words and you would apply them to our hearts by the work of the Holy Spirit. Soften our hearts to receive your word with gladness as we think about the great joy and the grace of Christmas. None of it deserved. And may we glorify and enjoy you and all that we do forever. We pray these things in Christ's precious name. Amen. It's like we said, we've been kind of taking a particular stanza of this hymn, Comfort, Comfort, Ye My People. And again, last week we talked about another way to think about that is it's not comfort like lazy boy comfort. It's more of trust, 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 ye my people. We find our comfort in the Lord. We trust in Him. And we're taking a few phrases from that hymn and using them just to focus on a few reasons why Christ coming into the world, theologically it's called the Incarnation, why this is such good news, why it was such good news, why it continues to be such good news. Last week, we looked at the phrase, speak ye peace, thus saith our God. We focused in on that word peace. And through Christ, the warfare between a holy God and a sinful people has ceased, and that's good news. This week, we're looking at, yea, her sins, our God will pardon. So last week, we looked at the word peace. Today's kind of key word is pardon that we're going to look at. And it says, it's blotting out each dark misdeed. And now because of Christ, after the hostility has ended, a new status is given, a status of pardon, a status of justification being declared right. Pardoned is defined to be released or set free from the legal consequences of an offense. But the big question we're going to ask this morning, the two kind of questions we're going to ask about, or we're going to think about this morning, is pardoned from what? And then pardoned for what? For what reason? What are we pardoned from? And what does this pardon allow us to do or release us to do? And so let's look at this first point. We're going to see that Christ came to set us free from the curse of the law. Christ came to set us free from the curse of the law. Remember, feel that when we uh, that opening before we read the scripture of this weight pressing down upon you, going to the temple, having to atone. Christ has set us free from the curse of the law. 
And right at the outset, we need to be careful not to call God's law a curse in and of itself. We're told in Psalm 19 that the precepts of the Lord are right, the commandment of the Lord is pure, the rules of the Lord are true and righteous. God is holy, and because of that, the law that he has said is holy in and of itself because it comes from him. But as we'll see, the problem is not with the character of God, is it? The problem's with us. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 10, if you have your Bible, you can look up a few verses. Galatians 3, 10 says that for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. So who is included uh, under the curse of not keeping the law of God? Every one of us. Every one of us. Many churches today have an anemic view of the scripture and salvation because they have an anemic view of God's holiness and by default an anemic view of God's law. And so they'll say, oh, well, we don't have to pay attention to all that. That's all Old Testament God with all the rules and commandments and all that kind of stuff. We are now in the New Testament age. What that does is basically divorce your New Testament from the bulk of your Bible if you're actually able to look at it. There's a whole lot of Old Testament. And we're reminded that God is holy, holy, holy. That is his defining attribute. He's not a big version of us. He's fully set apart, completely different. Holy, holy, holy. And because of that, his law is perfect. And it is holy. And we feel the weight of that, and we should. We should feel the weight of that. Because we see God as being high and lifted up, and he's holy, holy, holy. He's not our best friend. He's not a puppy dog to be controlled. He is the creator of the heavens and earth and upholds it all by the word of his power. He's holy. You think about that. And what we typically want to do when we think about God's holy law is we quickly want to skip to the forgiveness parts without hearing the bad news of our sin and our alienation from God under the law's demands. What we want to do is we want to skip to the manger, don't we? Let's skip, let's skip to the manger part. And we lo- but when we do that, we lose the context. And so why in the world would God give us his law? Simply put, to reveal his holiness and to show us our sin. The straight edge of the law shows us how crooked we are when compared to it. Here's what John Stott said. <clears throat> the purpose of the law was, as it were, to lift the lid off man's respectability And to disclose what he's really like underneath, sinful, rebellious, guilty, under the judgment of God, and helpless to save himself. A few verses later, Galatians 3, 22 to 23, Paul compares the law to a prison. He uses the Greek word phoreo, which is to be kept under guard, because even the smallest offense did not go unnoticed, under constant vigilance. Paul writes that we were held captive under the law. We were in bondage to its demands. And more than that, Satan wants us to feel like there's no way out. And he uses lies and deceit. Again, here's what Stott said that was really helpful. Stott wrote, God intended the law to reveal sin and drive men to Christ. Satan uses it to reveal sin and drive men to despair. God meant the law as an interim step to man's justification. Satan uses it as the final step to his condemnation. God meant the law as a stepping stone to liberty. Satan uses it as a cul-de-sac, deceiving his dupes into supposing that from its fearful bondage, there is no escape. You see, Satan longs to see the people of God fall into despair under the weight of the law. He wants to see God's people lose hope and just to start foolishly working to try to justify themselves because at that moment we're trapped in the cul-de-sac of a works-based righteousness. And you might be thinking, Dave, this is a terrible thing to talk about during the Christmas series. What a downer. I get it. Fair enough. I get that. But here's the thing. Jesus will never truly be the, quote, reason for the season, until you understand exactly what that reason is. You ever thought about that? We put it up there and we say, Jesus is the reason for the season. You ever wondered why? You ever wondered why? What that sign actually means? What it's pointing to is the fact that you, I, we need to be saved because we couldn't do it ourselves. You can't free yourself by trying to be good. It's a fool's errand. 
And the weight of God's law presses down upon us. It shows us our need just at the point where we think, ah, I got it. The law presses down upon us and reminds us, no, you don't. God's that holy. And it leads us to cry out like the Israelites, deliver us, deliver us, deliver us. And the law is like an x-ray machine. It can only show you your problem. It has no power to heal on its own. You need something else to heal and deliver you. And this is why Christmas is the announcement of good news. It's the announcement of the gospel. There is something new that has broken into this world and it changes absolutely everything. You notice as we've been lighting the candles, we're stepping up and we're thinking about all the ways that God has, through his prophets, spoken to his people. Think about through the shepherds. And you think about we're leading up to the manger. The manger didn't happen out of no context. It happened in real space and time and for a reason. And we feel the weight of that pressing down upon us, but it's good news. Did you feel the weight when we opened with that idea of having all your faults and failures read out loud and feeling the weight pressed down upon you? Did you feel the good news that washed over you when you heard the opening verses of, the, of Galatians 4? Look at verse 4 and 5. Read it again. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. There's a new way. There's hope. The sun is rising. You see, Jesus didn't come into the world as a baby because the father thought it would be cute. Jesus came into the world as a baby because you needed someone to live the perfect life. You could never live under God's holy law and die the perfect death that you could never die because you were born guilty under God's holy law. You needed to be set free from the just curse of the law that your sin merited. Got to feel the weight of that. The manger's not going to make sense if you don't feel that. If you're here and you do not trust Christ as Savior, we're so glad that you're here. But you need to realize that you remain under the just curse of God's law. You need to feel the weight of that. 2,000 years of Christianity has never flinched on this undeniable fact. You may not like it, but it is 100% true. You are under the curse of the law, and you stand condemned without a mediator, without a savior, on your own merit. That's scary. And I, as a minister, call you to flee to Christ, to set down the shovel of your own self-improvement, self-help way of living. Put it down and flee to Christ. He's your only hope. He's your only hope. Christmas is never going to make sense. Because if that's true, then the manger should look more like a spiritual lifeboat. You need the manger, but you also need the cross. We all need a savior. The manger, the cross, and the crown all hang together in one story of God's redemption. Galatians 3, 13. Paul's just been building this out. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. And so who's the us? Westminster Shorter Catechism question 20 asks a very helpful question. Did God leave all mankind to perish in the estate of sin and misery? What if the answer was yes? Did God leave all mankind to perish in the estate of sin and misery? What if the answer was yes? Would God be unjust? The answer is no, he would not. But here, listen to this answer. The answer, God having out of his mere good pleasure from all eternity elected some to everlasting life and did enter into a covenant of grace to deliver them out of the state of sin and misery and to bring them into an estate of salvation by a redeemer. And the next question asks, who is that redeemer? The Lord Jesus Christ. How did he come? Into the world as a baby through the incarnation to do what you and I could never do on our own. And that is the grace of Christmas. The very fact that that even happened at all should take your breath away. Should absolutely take your breath away. It's the absolute picture of grace. The Lord Jesus Christ is our Redeemer. And you think about this. Remember, the coming of Christ into the world happened in real space and time. We really believe that. Jesus was a real flesh and blood human. Fully God, fully man, how's that work? I don't know. But that's what he did. He came in. After hundreds of years of God's people groaning under the weight of their law, uh, the weight of God's law and their inability to save themselves, God steps in and he does something amazing. He came in flesh to rescue his people. 
The manger is the beginning of a rescue mission. Have you noticed that all three members of the Trinity are are present in this passage? When the fullness of time had come, God the Father sent forth his Son. Now look in verse 6. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. You have the Spirit mentioned. Why? The same Greek verb and tense is used where he sent forth his son and he sent forth the spirit. It's kind of a double sending forth by God the Father for a very specific purpose. What is that specific purpose? We're told. Born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that what? We might receive adoption as sons. It's amazing. And that's our second point. Christ came to set us free from the curse of the law. Second point Christ came to set us free for adoption into his family. Pardoned from what? Our sin and misery. Pardoned from his just wrath. But why? Pardoned for what reason? So that we could be adopted into his family. It's amazing when you think about it. Now, ladies, I know that you read this and think, well, I'm not a son. Now you know how us guys feel when we're called the bride. Some things are just a mystery. It's always hard, it's always hard to fully understand. You are sons, we are the bride. Thanks be to God, right? <laughs> this language, though, conveys something very important about this new status, okay? This new status of God's redeemed people who come from all nations, tribes, and tongues, Jew and Gentile. You know, we, we hear this teaching of Paul where he says, we're all united in Christ, There's neither slave nor free or male nor female or, you know, we're all one in Christ. And so I I always just love the fact that heaven is going to be just beautifully diverse. And there's going to be people in heaven that you're like, you're here? You're here too? The amazing thing is like that you even get to be there. It's amazing. This language conveys something very important about this new status of God's people. This adoption of sons phrase is inheritance language. This is firstborn sons, heirs to the heavenly kingdom, heirs of the covenant promises of God. This is, this is now yours, and there is nothing that can take it away from you. It's a status change. And look, verse 6, God has sent the spirit of his sons into our hearts to do what? So we can cry, Abba, Father. Jesus promised something very unique in John 14, 15 to 18. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And then he says this, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. What a promise. Again, here's what Stott said. So the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit witnessing to our sonship and prompting our prayers is the precious privilege of all God's children. It is because you are sons that God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. No other qualification is needed. And the way he assures us of our, sonship, of our sonship is not by some spectacular gift or sign, but the quiet inward witness of the Spirit as we pray. That you are now by faith a part of the family. And as such, you have all the rights and privileges of being a part of the kingdom of God. All by grace, all by mercy. All of it undeserved. Isn't that amazing? You think so? Jesus said in John chapter 10, verses 27 to 28, He said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will be able to snatch them out of my hand. That is security. So, what's the payoff? What's the payoff? Verse 7. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. You see, here's the thing. Christians have been set free from the orphanage of the world and been given a forever family. The world out there doesn't care. You're just another cog in the machine. But if you are united to Christ, you are a son and daughter of the king forever, whom God sought out 
and wrote your name in the book before the foundation of the world and at just the right time called you to himself. That is amazing. Absolutely amazing. Think about this. The Son of God willingly left the throne room of the Father to enter into this world as a helpless baby to, give the, to, to live the righteous life that we never could, die the death that we all deserved, so that traitors like us could be welcomed into the family of God by sheer grace and mercy. The manger that we all want to skip to, it's a rescue plan. It's a lifeboat. It's amazing. Do you hear the voice of Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, calling to you from the pages of his word and the manger of his advent by the power of the Holy Spirit? I don't know where you stand with the Lord. I'll be up front. I'd love to talk with you, pray with you. Do you feel the Lord calling to you from the pages of his word by the power of the Holy Spirit? Do you hear the angel saying, like in Luke 2, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Do you believe that? That he is a Savior, not just a self-help coach to help you get better. That he is a Savior and that you need salvation. Do you hear the voice of Jesus calling weary spiritual orphans like us into his adopted family? Will you respond in faith to the call of the shepherd? Are you willing to finally lay down your self-salvation project and run towards the father who calls you his own? Are you tired of wondering, have I done enough? Have I obeyed enough? Have I proven myself enough? Have I done enough spiritual stuff in the right order to finally bring it to the Lord and say, Lord, is this enough? Will you finally be gracious to me? If that's the way you're living, you're not looking for grace, you're looking for wages. This is what I've done, Lord. Have I done enough to finally merit the paycheck? That's not the gospel. It's not. It's not wages, it's grace, it's a gift given to us by a gracious and loving God who on the heels of our train wreck of our sins sent his son into the world who willingly left the father's throne and was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross and came in a manger. You see, you don't get the cross until you get the manger. The manger, the cross, and the crown, they all hang together. You take the manger out, you don't have the cross. There's nobody that dies in your place in real space and time. See, the manger is an exclamation point that at just the right time, God sent forth his son to redeem those, us, who were under the curse of the law so that we could be set free because we're children of God adopted into his family and now we can come before the throne and say, Abba, Father, Please hear my prayer. And his mercy seat is open because we are no longer seen as an enemy. We're part of his family. Don't you get it? It's amazing. There's not a checklist. You're waiting for me to give you the checklist. Well, what's the 10 ways that I can be a better Christian? There is not that. It's look to Jesus. Rest in Jesus. Trust in Christ. That's it. You think, that's really offensive. Dave, you should be telling me what to do. No, I shouldn't. Look to Jesus. Look to Christ. Rest in his word. Rest in Christ. Trust in Christ. Look to Christ. It's all Christ. You're not the center of the wheel. He is. Look to Jesus and live. He will change your life. The spirit will work in your heart. Are there do's and don'ts in the scripture? Yes, there are. But we don't obey so that he will love us. We obey because he already loves us. It moves from a duty into a choice. I want to. I want to live a life that's pleasing to you. I want to obey you. Because you've been so good to me. Because you sent your son into the world to die in my place. How can I ever say thank you enough? You see, the gospel changes everything. It moves from do this, do that, and if you don't, you're in trouble. It moves from that into I love you, and it is finished. It's finished. Rest in Christ. We're about to sing a great hymn of the faith that we're going to close with. And I want you to notice what happens if you change the lyrics to point to what you've done. 
Hear this. Great is my faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with me. It sounds weird, doesn't it? Great is my faithfulness. Some of y'all are living the Christian life like that. Great is my faithfulness. It sounds odd, doesn't it? Now imagine how God hears it when you live your Christian life like that. All of the glory goes to God alone. All of our hope is found in Christ alone. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, as revealed in the scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. There's no I or me in the gospel. If you say, look at how great I am, you missed it. It's how great are you, O Lord. You are worthy of all praise. What does the manger point to? What's this whole thing point to? Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord. The manger of Christ led to the cross of Christ. There's no shortcut. What did that accomplish? We're about to sing it. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. What we talked about the past two weeks, peace and pardon. There it is. What did that accomplish? Instead of hearing a detailed list of our red pen failures because of Christ, we are now hearing a pronouncement of peace and forgiveness. We hear it is finished. What does that give us here in the here and now? We're about to sing it. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Because our hope is found not in ourselves and what we do. It's found in Christ and Christ alone. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today, bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with 10,000 beside. Every single one of them given to you by grace and mercy and you didn't deserve it. And it was because God loves you. It changes Christmas. You know the reason, the real reason for the season, why Jesus came in the world? Your sin. That's the real season. That's the real reason for the season. So that you could be redeemed and rescued. Changes everything. Now we can sing these Christmas songs with vigor because they're songs of grace. Comfort, comfort ye my people. Trust, trust my people in Christ alone. Why? Because when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, that you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Every blessed word of it by grace. Hear the good news of Christmas. God the Father heard the cries of his people. And in the fullness of time he answered by sending his only begotten son to set his people free. Great is his faithfulness. Let's pray. Father, as we dwell upon your entrance or your son's entrance into the world as our savior... May we see the incarnation not just as some cute thing that you did, but the inauguration of a rescue plan to redeem us from the curse and the weight of the law that we could never do on our own. Lord, help us to see our great need for you. We need thee every hour, not just some of the time, all the time. Help us to see our need. Lord, help us to take our eyes off of ourself and what we have done and help us to look to Christ and Christ alone. Lord, you are worthy of all glory and honor and praise. We bring our worship to you because of all that you have done. And we are grateful, Lord, when we think about our own sin and all the ways that we fell short and continue to fall short, that in the fullness of time, you sent forth your son, born of a woman, to redeem us from the weight of the law. And we are now set free. And now by grace alone, through faith alone, we are your children. And so we come and we plead with you, O Father. Please remind us of your mercy. Remind us of your grace. Remind us of the wonder of Christmas. 
as we wait for your return. Help us to find comfort and trust in all the ways that you have kept your promises up until this point and remind us that if you have been faithful to this point, you will be faithful to the end. Great is thy faithfulness. Amen.